And down here on the bottom right with the blue Zerg pieces, it's Misaki. Fantastic camera work here already by Mapu, who's going to be joining us for every single series here today. So if the, you know, the angles are going to look a little bit nicer than you're used to, that would be the reason as to why. There's going to be a massive difference in my observing last season to Mapu's observing it today. I can promise you that much. This is one of the easiest and simplest ways to improve the show. We have our beautiful dedicated ops, Mapu. He's going to be here all day with us as well, showing us the action. I let us focus a bit more on actually what's happening in the games as well, which is obviously awesome from our point of view. So, yeah, uh, like I say, I gotta gotta love that. Absolutely nothing to hate about it. As we get set up here on Golden Aura for game number one, Loco, we are in this new map mm -hmm. pool that has a bunch of newer and weirder maps, although we are going to start with a map that's familiar to all. Yeah, we have actually seen the new maps quite a bit in, for example, the GSL, but also the Weekly Cups. I was actually a little surprised to see how frequently they've been chosen so far, especially certain maps, like for example, Pose Youth, that are just very weird, and we've seen them in basically all the events so far. Golden Ara, of course, a map that we've had for some time already. It's probably been maybe half a year or so at this point in time, but I do fully expect we're going to be seeing some of the crazier maps as well. And besides, of course, the new, well, maps that we now have part of this, uh, this tournament, we also have a multiplayer balance patch that went live since last time. There are a couple of changes, relatively minor across the board. I would say the most significant change would be to the Widow Mine. Overall, a little bit weaker, but certainly still very strong. Yeah, the Widow Mine is actually kind of fun. The fact that people can just see it so much more easily as well. Like that line that's just like, hey, look, this is what I'm targeting. I feel like I've already seen examples of where that has been the saving grace a lot of the time. Where that has really been the opportunity to be like, oh, right. I can, you know, in a panic moment, it's much easier to immediately pick out exactly what's going on where I need to be, how I need to be there, and all of that good stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, actually a very interesting change altogether. Still expecting, as we kind of mentioned, Oliveira to be big favorite in this one. And I'm kind of wondering if Misaki comes in with that kind of game plan of how the heck do I disrupt Oliveira? How the heck do I put him away from kind of the expectation of, like, letting him kind of control this game? Because Oliveira is like that. He's an aggressive player. He's a feisty player. He will be up in your face at the very first moment if you let him. And, and that's what you've got to try and figure out how to stop, because I don't know if Misaki has the ability to control stuff like that, but we lose the Reaper at the start of the game, and that's a big deal as Oliveira is the first to make a mistake. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, this is one of those moments where Zerk could, for example, if you're feeling really crazy, cancel link speed, add the drones back into the gas, put down a Roach Warren really quickly. You do really want to keep the Reaper alive. That is certainly a bit of a misstep right there from Oliveira. He wanted to get that creep tumor and then got a little bit greedy. All things considered, though, I am fully expecting here that Oliveira is just going to play a safe and sound match, right? So we have a classical 1-1-1 one, one, one here. No triple CC, but straight into a, well, a starport there before adding on that third command center. I do fully expect that we're going to see, oh, a third CC in a moment. But the armory, I mean, it's 50 gas cheaper now with the new patch. It gets planted down real early, Wardy. These help out attacks cost a little bit less to invest into. Obviously, you're still going to be later on the third CC than you might typically be, but... Oliveira going to utilize, like you say, that gas change, and he's going to put that armory down, get the Hellbats rolling, and I imagine we are going to be off and across the map very soon. I mean, this is going to hit quickly because that armory can come down a little sooner. So the first, you know, five, six Hellions are going to get across. Only three Marines in that medevac, but right now, Misaki really doesn't have much to deal with this. This is going to be the defense with the Queens, and really just the Queens. There's only six Lings on the map, so they aren't going to help very much at all. Oh, here we go. Well, the Hellbats do need to be morphed into Hellbats first. I mean, we have the Hellions for now just taking a bit of a beating. And so far, Misaki is doing just fine. Maybe a little bit late right there on the droning, but this may work out in his favor because so far, well, his worker count is looking really healthy. Oliveira at only 29. Maybe the Hellions in the main base, though, can get some work done. Three workers, totally acceptable. I think he can probably lose upwards of like 10 and still be fine. Medivac goes down, and now we finally morph into Hellbats. I think seven drones, totally fine for dessert. Yeah, it is going to slow him down a little bit. Now, this is obviously not fully dealt with this Hellion on the low ground, but that's going to get dealt with as well. And yeah, Oliveira kind of flops on this attack. I wonder if he just sort of saw a lack of links. It was like, okay, I don't actually need Hellbats. So he just tried to micro yeah. with the Hellions, but it just took so long to really get into action. I mean, this is where you can still do well because Misaki is refusing to rebuild links. He yeah. is just droning. He says the answer to all of this harass and you trying to kill my drones is just to make so many, you can't possibly kill them all. 
he just made 18 links this entire game so far, which is actually a very small amount considering the aggression here from Oliveira. Keep in mind, there's no third command center done yet here for the Terran. It's about halfway finished. It's at the front. This should be something that Misaki sees, although yeah, that Overlord is not actually poking all the way to... Uh, the vision there, but ultimately Mizaki here is in a fantastic position. I don't really think, being the underdog in a match like this, that you can be in a much better spot within the first six minutes of a game. No, I mean, you have all the drones in the world. Like, you asked yourself for the macro game, but from a fantastic spot, I mean, realistically, what can Oliveira push with right now that has any real strength behind it, as long as you start making units off of this drone count that you've established? You're in an absolutely golden position as that Liberia Siege is going to go after a couple of those drones. Oh. We just see these Hellions, though, are going to get by. And I mean, at some point, is this Greed going to catch up to her? Maybe right now, there's still not many Lings on the map, and this is where we are. Going to lose a bunch of workers, and maybe just holding down the drone button was not the right answer. As 21 will fall, and these Hellions will get a good few Lings along with it. Yeah, the queens were sleeping on the job. They were all in one big bunch on the left side. And Oliveira said, yo, if that's where your queens are hanging out, don't mind if I do. And just like that, I mean, the first six minutes of this game were really good for Mizaki. And then the last 30 seconds, not so much. Yeah, this really started off very well and then just went yeah. absolutely horrendous very, very quickly afterwards. What a disaster, just out of absolutely yeah. nowhere. Just, I mean, I guess it was coming. The guy was like, hey, I'm just going to drone. And it's like, okay, well, that actually worked the first time because you held this off. But then he was like, I am, and I'm only going to drone. And we're like, no, no, no. At, at some point, we have to, like, stop the drones. Bro. He's like, I'm going to keep droning. But the thing from Oliver was that he kept building Hellions, right? That's something yeah. you don't typically see. You don't see that next wave of Hellions in that kind of number. So maybe Misaki was not wrong. But then when that amount of Hellion shows up, he didn't have Lings ready. He was maybe waiting for the, you know, Marines with Stim and stuff, which has been, you know, another minute down the line. In that case, he would have been fine against the Hellions. Not quite so much. And Oliveira ends up netting himself the first map of victory to start things off today. I think if he had the Queens in a slightly better spot, he would be fine too. So one thing we see quite a bit now at the highest level for Zerg players is that they have multiple control groups for the Queens. Oftentimes also for the Queens that are spreading the creep around the map, they also are in multiple control groups. So one squad on the left, one squad on the right. And we just sort of saw all the Queens standing there in one big bunch. If they would have been in the right position when those Hellions drove in that direction, it would have been fine. But ultimately they started chasing, well, very fast staring units. And yeah, ultimately that was just a little too much. So that's the beauty of a game of StarCraft, right? I mean, that was certainly not the beginning that Oliveira was hoping for, but then like a house of cards, it all came well, tumbling down right there for Misaki. But he did put himself in a really good spot. I'm not exactly sure what his plan was though, going into it, right? So I actually expected him to play something a bit more aggressively because Oliveira is happy to play the macro game and just, well, make a bunch of command centers and really create a massive army off of that so i kind of expected him to maybe do some roach aggression or something along those lines and if he would have had a roach warren down in this game and he just attacked right after for example that first group of hellions fell flat on its face that was a very good opportunity for him to just straight up win game number one but anyways we have to find out here what happens on uh, on ghost river which is one of the new maps a map with a very quick rush distance oh absolutely ghost river i'm kind of surprised to almost see that um <clears throat> this is, you know, I'm kind of surprised to see that this is like even in the map pool in a way because a lot of people are saying this map is very good for Terran actually, where it's like you can just sit, defend, there's a limited amount of bases. So if you go late game, it's very difficult for Zerg to ever get that one base advantage that they need against a Terran player. So I gotta imagine that that is kind of interesting for me to see Misaki being here, but maybe the Misaki has some kind of aggressive plan in general. Yeah, one of the problems you run into here, as a Zerg player at least, is that you only have one third base option. So if Terran blocks it, you're in a world of trouble. You have to play very flexibly, and then there's that siege tank spot behind the rocks yeah. with like the mineral fields right next to it, those skinny mineral fields too. There's a bunch of really good positions, and like you said, Terran can just, well, sort of mech her up and slowly build up that eco. So I'm a little surprised to see this as well in game number two of a best of three, because we do now have nine maps in the map pool, meaning that the players can actually veto quite a few. And apparently Mizaki let this one slip through the cracks. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely an interesting little factor that we're going to see this map at all. So let's go in game. Let's have a peek and let's see whether or not we're going to have any upset at all. As in the top right, we do have the player who is absolutely the favorite, our world champion of StarCraft 2 from Dragon Kaizy Gaming. It's Oliveira.
And up here in the top left-hand corner of the map, with the blue Zerg pieces, it's Misaki. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the camera, the right. camera zoomed, dude. You couldn't do that last season. You know what, Nero? Sometimes I forgot to do it. I don't late. <laughs> you know, at the end of the 10-hour day, my brain was like, oh, wait, I was meant to zoom in, now I zoom in. Kokas is already talking about the SCV proxy, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> We got to do the introduction. What if you don't know who's yeah. playing? I love how the first thing that Matthew said to me was, hey, <laughs> I hate the introductions, but <laughs> how, how are we doing them? <laughs> I was like, oh, Matthew. <laughs> You're in for a bad time. We're going to introduce everybody every time. I promise you. I feel like it's the worst if you're an observer, right? You're a dedicated observer and the casters just will not do the intro. And you're just sitting there with your camera centered on the command center or the hatchery. And nothing's really happening. You just, you know, at some point you start shaking the camera a little bit to maybe try and see if you can wake up the casters. But we'll try and help you out, Mapu. We'll, we'll try and make it easy for you. But at some point we may have to do introduction chicken, you know, or you may just have to do it by yourself. <laughs> at some point you'll just start like typing away but we actually don't have his screen so we can't even see him type <laughs> we've really we've really muted the observers completely for this event loco it's a whole new yeah. level no Mapu can't even really talk back to us at all he would have to dedicate to typing on the observer chat and that is just that is yeah. not cool I we can't do that can't do that that's a step too far yeah, now it's in, it's part of the replay files too you know like that would just be a disaster <laughs> so Mapu has been completely silenced well, amongst the silencing, there is, uh, once again, a little bit of a setup going on here. Oliveira is not going second gas just yet, and if he doesn't take it right now, but pretty much what he actually does, so as I was about to say, then we are going to be seeing that third CC, but second gas comes in, so we will see ourselves with another little bit of Terran aggression. Even though the last game, it didn't exactly start out brilliantly, in the end, it got him there. This is going to be round two of at least doing something a bit aggro or starport before we expand again. This is just something yep. which on this map especially, I guess, makes a lot of sense. This could just be Hellion Banshee, right? Play very safe on a short rush distance map. Make sure roaches aren't going to come and kill you while also having great harassment options for yourself. Uh, that would be my, you know, initial guess just because it's also a very standard way to play. But we'll see what exactly it is that Oliver wants to do because he could drop an armory and just whack out a help out attack one more time. Yeah, I think Oliveira is doing this specifically against Misaki right now because he knows he's the favorite going into this. And one of the nice advantages, one of the byproducts of opening up with a later third command center is that you actually, well, can't really lose against a whole lot of Zerk aggression. Even if you, for example, go up against Roaches, as long as you have, for example, Hellion Benchy, you should have plenty of defensive units out against that sort of attack. Right now, though, yeah, it is a bit uncommon, right? At the highest level of StarCraft to go for the starport before the third command center, but Oliveira just making sure that he's as safe as possible. And even though he did the exact same thing in game number one and he did end up winning it, he didn't really win it based off of that strat. Here we go again. We just have the one-to-one -one copy. It's he, once more an armory. He just wants to send it, man. He's just going to plop that armory down. We're going to get this on the go, and we are going to see what happens as... To be fair, I feel like if he made the Hellbats hell yeah. hell last time, he might have seen more success. So maybe he can just see that adjustment and say, hey, I can actually do better than I did last time. So let's just try and do that this time. Because, yeah, this is the exact same. Three Marines, Chunk of Hellions, Armory on the way. The only defense right now is five Lings, four Queens. Not even a super high Queen count. No, he saw the uh, Hellions also fly by or I guess drive by that Overlord. One of the OVs actually does fall and he didn't start up any Zerklings there until, well, much later. Now all of a sudden though, this Terran army is indeed on the creep. Matter of fact, super helpful here as well. Queens do try to target it down, but I don't think there's even remotely enough defense so far here for the Zerk player. Still not really starting up a lot of links. I mean, he's been a bit supply block, but he's had at least a little bit available to, well, add on some additional defenses. And now suddenly Oliveira is getting the damage done that he was looking for in game number one of this series. Still though, his worker count is really nothing to write home about. But yeah, Oliveira certainly getting more than what he got in game number one. Yeah, the question now, I guess, is like, hey, do I run into the natural or do I just sit and kill the third base? And he says, I'm going to run into the natural. Right now, there's enough Hellbats still alive without Queen support. That GG. realistically, at any point, you can just always fight the Lings, right? And I think that's what this comes down to. As you say, GG is.